Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've been working with the LEAP schools for one year and four months as of today with Mampella, Rimpala, which most of you know is the co-president of the International Club of Rome, and with John Gilmore, the founder and CEO of, of LEAP. Uh, you've all been sent a brief resume, both of LEAP and of John, but I wanted to emphasize that he's founded a series of important educational NGOs in South Africa, Bridge, which is educational in innovation with Mampella Rempella, and the South African Extraordinary Schools Coalition, which transforms lives in socioeconomic uh, vulnerable spots throughout South Africa, and then the Global Teachers Institute. And today, John is going to discuss the LEAP schools, secondary schools of STEM, Schools of Math and Science Teaching, which he founded 17 years ago, and therefore is a, is a very stable, sustainable fixture in South Africa. And what occurred during the COVID-19 epidemic, where he could move the learners onward in their learning and not have them regress or not have them uh, stop their classes when all the schools were closed, even though they're in the lowest economic uh, strata of South Africa. So it's important uh, that this model be looked at internationally and realize that there's a lot to be learned. When Barry Hughes did a scenario, which John will show you, and I told him what the elements were uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa, he found that applying John's model throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, which now has 100 million secondary students and primary students not in the school system, it would impact the population growth rates because 66% of the students are girls, <clears throat> the productivity of the nations, the food, and the immigration. Uh, so we're looking forward to your questions, but with um, great pleasure, I introduce John Gilmore, who's the founder and the CEO of the LEAP Schools and a member of COR. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Anitra. Thank you to Jean Doughty for creating this platform and enabling an invitation for this kind of presentation to happen. And of course, to Art Hunter for setting it up in the way that he, he has done with all the uh, success elements already set up so well. I really appreciate this opportunity to share with you something of the learning of the Leap Science and Math Schools work in South Africa, which has not been uh, an attempt to create a boutique of uh, success stories, but rather an experimental space of laboratories of teaching and learning that will ultimately contribute towards revolutionizing African education. The, the, at the core of our work lies the notion of self-liberation, and that self-liberation can only be achieved through consciousness development, and our focus area is children in sub-Saharan Africa. So, the assumption that we are challenging really is a Eurocentric history in Africa in terms of education, which has left us with a, an education bureaucracy and very passive learning methodologies. And it's, it's my assertion that that's failed Africa. Our hypothesis really is that consciousness education needs to be a key focal point for a shift to a successful African education system. And I hope tonight to be able to share with you what the substance and the form of that consciousness education looks like. The current reality that Anitra so adequately sketched is that 94 million African children and youth are not at school. And it's getting worse, millions are dropping out of school, compounded by the recent pandemic of the, the last uh, 12, 13 months. The result, of course, is not just that the dropout of school happens, but not leading only to unemployed 
masses of people, but to unemployable masses of people. And this represents a threat to peace. And as you would be very aware, the, the people who are greatest at greatest risk in this kind of context, historically and in the present, are young women. So where are we? Many of the questions that were being asked in the 1970s under the oppressive regime of apartheid are still the questions asked by young people in South Africa. The society you see isn't healed. We achieved a, politica, a dramatic political set settlement in 1994, but the economic realities remain almost unchanged. And in some ways is considered to have gone backwards. So again, the children are asking those questions. Now, our methodology that we've developed is underpinned by educational voices, such as the voice of Abraham Maslow, who says, what is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. And if we see education as a primary space for real change and growth and development, then we need our children to change the awareness of themselves so that we can live out the dream of somebody like Martin Luther King, who brought it right down to his longing for the children, that his own children would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That requires some significant change in a, in a landscape which has been colonized and oppressed. And just to give you an, a, a, a glimpse of the extent of that oppression, please understand that black children in South Africa were precluded by apartheid law from studying maths and physical science prior to 1994. And most of the teachers in the country grew up in that system. So we have an embedded problem. Steve Biko was the founder of the Black Consciousness Movement and he was the initiator along with uh, Dr. Rampella, our co-president of the Club of Rome, of the notion of black consciousness, which was fundamentally in encouraging and endorsing people to seek their own liberation and not to wait for the liberation to come from outside. Many of you will uh, know that he was murdered by the apartheid regime in 1977 at a very young age of 30. And his strong assertion that the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed still holds true today because of the internalized oppression and the internalized oppressor mindset. The context in which we're working varies from overcrowded urban uh, conditions, which we call townships, ghettos, if you like, uh, informal constructs, very little in the way of service delivery and in the way of normal health services. And these are the landscapes that we have chosen in our work to, to create LEAP so that we can show that the hypothesis is real in any given context. And so that we can build big futures in the broken spaces of Southern Africa. What are we challenging? We're challenging essentially the inbuilt assumption that cognitive development is the priority of good education. Everything we do in school builds around that assumption, it seems. Regurgitation, memorization, or more important than insight, critical thinking and understanding. And yet we live in the 21st century that requires global citizens who are intuitive, compassionate, agile, intrinsically motivated and adaptive, and of course skilled. So how does head knowledge accumulation, maybe new buildings and the endless production of textbooks produce this? Well, they don't. Hence my assertion that colonial education has failed Africa. And if we simply try to improve that system, it could take 150 years for us to even begin to visualize a close in the education divide. And we simply don't have that time. This process also just perpetuates the pattern of low expectations, which of course is the, one of the fundamental causes of the reality. So we start with a simple reclaiming of a value system that is essentially African. <coughs> we understand that real education of children can only happen effectively in a culturally coherent context. 
when they can make sense of who they are and where they come from. And we work at this, um, at this process of consciousness development in healing circles on a daily basis for every child. Sorry, let me just go back. So what is this concept of Ubuntu? Ubuntu is the African idea of personhood. Persons depend on other persons to be. Now that may not sound that profound, but it challenges the notion of rugged individualism and it embeds the value system of interdependent humanity. And I'm pleased to, to, to say that Carlos and others in, who are in this call are actually exploring this African philosophy of Ubuntu to see how we can incorporate the, the system and the thinking into a new, a new way of looking at economic reality and to, to, to develop the notion of a wellness economy. The simplest way of looking at Ubuntu is, I am human because of you. My humanity is only measured in terms of your humanity. And of course, the same applies to nature. I'm human because of mother nature and mother nature needs me to be the custodian of that reality rather than the abuser and the user and the exploiter. So we've been doing some revolutionary work methodology, applied methodology to try and work at unlocking the whole child. And we work in six sites uh, three of them are pure urban overcrowded uh, sites, as I described. One or two of them are in, in the peri-urban fringe, and one is in the rural village in Limpopo, spread across the country. Four different uh, pro provinces, six different regions. And we have a total of about 1,700 children across the five grades of grade eight through grade 12. 65, more than 65% of our children, as Anitra said, a young woman and over 65% of our teachers are also women and, and that's by design. What is this process of consciousness development as we understand it? Well the goal is to move children from learning poverty, which is a concept really being developed and refined in the language of the World Bank and, and uh, related uh, organizations, to the mastery of science and maths. So the learning poverty is really not only about poverty, it's about the poverty of the learning space and the poverty of the, the quality of teaching and teachers. So it's our belief that the African child will thrive if they make the leap from the internalized fixed mindset, which is survival focused to a values driven growth mindset. Now that's a mouthful, but I'd ask you just to pause on that. It's what neuroscience is telling us that for years we've had, we've imposed on children a fixed mindset of you can't do that because you're not clever enough, or you can't do that because you don't have enough support. We, we are working to break that and we've broken it. it. It's a mindset that is reinforced when children are living in survival. We need to move that. What happens in the conversations that we have, the difficult conversations that we have in the healing circles on a daily basis is that the child experiences a breakthrough and realizes something about themselves and starts to be able to step back and view their own lives and understand themselves with choices. And once a child understands that they have choices, even when they feel trapped or feel like there is no choice, there are choices, choices in how to respond to what you're in. Then the child starts to be believe maths learning is possible. And when the child starts to believe that, that this is just a hurdle that I have to cross, rather than this is the wall that stops me, in those moments, real academic success from the most unlikely places, if you like, growing roses from the cracks in the cement is what we're trying to do. And when a child breaks this failure-fearing silence, because the silence of fear becomes very, very oppressive and the consequent compliance, self-liberation begins. And we, we've learned that instead of the teacher being the only critical element in the learning process, 
if you apply the Ubuntu logic of looking to each other for strength and looking to each other for mirrors that will tell the truth to each other, speak the truth to the power of the peer group, rather than reinforce what the peer group uh, na dominant narrative is, that's a critical element of self-liberating pedagogy. This support is provided in addition, obviously, to the teacher facilitating this consciousness, consciousness development process. And it can be provided by children supporting each other at an emotional level in these life orientation circles of healing every day for every child. And at an academic level in subject focused learning support groups, which can be face to face, but in recent months have been online. We have role models. We have wonderful African role models. Uh, we have Wangari Matai, whom we all know was the first African woman Nobel Peace Prize winner. And she said, it's important for young women to know that it's okay for them to be the way they are, to see the way they are as a strength and to be liberated from fear and from silence. And we add the word to be liberated by themselves from fear and from silence with support of each other. And so our goal is to activate in each child, particularly in our young woman children who have to endure so much of a disintegrating patriarchy with all of the fallout that goes with that, to activate the authentic voice and to be willing to speak truth to power. This of course extends into the world of a deteriorating and disintegrating in some ways global uh, reality. And Mangari started with the basic encouragement that it's the little things that we can do that will make the difference. And so we put all of our children through the process of experiential action, citizen science, if you like, planting, regenerating, working with unique plants such as the speckworm that sequesters carbon at an unprecedented rate so that we can regenerate ecosystems and so that we can encourage the young leaders of, of this era to be civic minded, but also to be activists uh, in terms of citizen science. Integrated into that, we also bring in the community nutrition and our schools become the sites of planting and growing vegetables, which are shared into the community. And we're trying to in fact develop uh, regenerative, ed regenerating education, regenerative education for the new civilization that we all long for. And we have to do this by building young leaders who understand the need. We extend this to leap uh, to the water quality testing project where every child, again, pushing into the citizen science mode becomes a, a citizen scientist, able to do water quality testing, able to apply the science, to, be, to develop their own agency, to be able to influence change and ultimately advocate for improved health and for uh, better water quality. To do this, we obviously have to go through teaching, conduct, conducting water sampling and analyzing samples, interpreting information and so on. And of the benefits to that uh, project, uh, obviously we're in the process of that project, but the benefits are going to be very easy to predict. Not only that, we also push our children into the uh, specific science journeys of exploration. And this is an example of a, a collaborative project with uh, a nearby school where we participated in 2018 in the Cecil Solar Challenge, which involved designing and building a car, a solar powered car from scratch, and then driving it nearly 2000 kilometers in a competition with seven other entities. We were the only school contribution and we came third and the rest of the contributors were universities. Very proud of that, uh, that work as we break the shackles of history by giving our children symbolic successes that can be shared. Now, when we step back from all of this and we look then over the 17 years at what success indicators we have, we go to the traditional success, success indicators as because everyone understands them. But if we look at in South Africa, the national dropout rate from grade one through to grade 12 is 58% if you include the failure rates. In the LEAP context, we've restricted that to 85%. Access to university because of the quality of the education we're offering is 72% of our students have the right to access to university. 
Now that you've got to measure against the 21% average nationally, but more so against the 5% average of the communities in which we work. The average for the communities in which we work is 5%. Fortunately, even the, um, many of the, the 38, the 28% can also gain access to uh, other higher education institutions such as colleges. What's happened to our graduates when they've left school and they've gone to universities and to technicons and to colleges is an interesting uh, pie chart here to show that 12% have gone into commerce, 17% into engineering, 19% into direct science and research, 13% into information technology. And we're very proud that 12% have chosen the high road and gone into education to become teacher activists, to give momentum to this uh, belief in consciousness development. Just as an aside, the LEAP family size averages with five siblings. At this stage, the early indications are that the graduates of LEAP will reduce their average family size to two siblings. There's no emigration from any of our students and our students are driven to be agents of change in their own communities. And over 180 of our students have become teachers. Three of our six schools are led as principals, the principals of the schools are young alumni from the LEAP school itself. And what better way of, of, of sharing the success than having leadership that was schooled in the same uh, in institution. You may wonder about the costs. We are a private institution because uh, we, we need to be outside of the constraints and bureaucracy in order to achieve some of these things. And if you take the average state cost per learner, without taking into failure rate, it's $1,700 per annum. LEAP is at a flat rate of $2,000 per annum. But if you then look at, you take the pass rates and calculate the actual cost, the actual cost for every graduate in the state system is $3,600 per year. And for LEAP would be $2,300. So this is not a high end boutique solution where the private schooling costs would be in the region of at the lowest end, $3,500, and going anywhere up to $120,000, uh, $120, sorry. Now, COVID-19 woke us up to the reality that the fourth industrial revolution is upon us. It's no longer an option to engage and negotiate. And in fact, connectivity is no longer, is no longer a privilege. It needs to be considered a basic human right. And if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's almost true to say that that's where Wi-Fi sits in the modern economy. And COVID has, has widened the, the digital divide. It has made the gap between the haves and the have-nots even wider. From our own point of view, obviously adjusting to this led to increased costs in 2020, but we worked hard and with support from people in this room, Marilyn, others, Nitra, um, helped us to actually navigate our way to, to, to manage those costs. And we're very grateful for that. We believe that Africa should adapt to the fourth industrial revolution by being practical and putting a cell phone in the hand of every child and not trying to imagine a world in which uh, the, the entitlement is that everyone owns a laptop. The costs are too high. We have a, a billion uh, people living in Africa, over a billion people living in Africa and the average age is 19. We need solutions that are practical. In 2050, we will have 2 billion people in Africa and we will have a billion children. We need solutions that can work. We need to ensure that data is provided and we're looking obviously to some of the exciting possibilities of current space exploration to provide that data to Africa at a, at a much lower uh, uh, price and obviously and if you take the cell phone solution with limited data, it's a cost effective solution. And Archbishop Tutu has been our champion in calling for COVID-19 to awaken to the need to actually spend money, not just on the PPE, but also on the, on the work of connectivity. So LEAP in 2020, we committed to using cell phones and we said we'll only use software that uses cell phones. We're not going to try and, and do anything that will exclude our students. And to our surprise, there's so much available 
that we, we were overwhelmed with the options. We were not limited. This enables schools with limited income to empower their learners. And instead of schools having to provide devices, we work to a project of every child has their own device. And it's a bring your own device to school. And when you're in lockdown, use your own device. This is still a work in progress. And we're still striving to purchase some cell phones. And, and we have ongoing data costs to ensure the success. But it's worth doing. It's worth putting ourselves out at risk. And obviously, anyone with ideas on how to how to accelerate that would be would be wonderful. Now, I want to show you what I consider to be a miracle. So we were in lockdown for months last year, and while we were not in lockdown, we were in rotational learning, and the projection was that the results at the end of the year would be expected to have fallen dramatically. So much so that another African country, Kenya public schooling has abandoned one year of education and everybody is repeating the year in 2021. We managed to, when we did our, our data collection at the end of last year, to see that uh, in the 2020 column, you'll see that we were on par, if not just slightly ahead, in all five of our grades in terms of the children who passed. That is remarkable. Bear in mind that in South Africa, straight after lockdown, 15% of children in our country at public schools dropped out. When the schools reopened, the reduction in numbers was 15%. The reduction in our numbers was zero. And we attribute that strongly to the fact that we were able to support and connect using cell phones and very simple technology. But the access to, to each other and to the information stream and to the creativity that cell phones can give you was sufficient. Anita and I are uh, about to publish a, a journal publication, which we will send and share with all of you, if you're interested, that outlines in more detail the success of this project. Again, we are very grateful to so many people, including those in this room, for helping us with that. So what did the cell phone technology do? Essentially, this is a feedback that came from an independent study by, by the National Education Consortium Trust in association with the South African Education Department. When we told them what we were doing, they said, can we come and do an assessment? And their conclusion was access to cell phone technology allowed students to connect with each other and their peers and support each other. They supported each other both emotionally and with learning. And there's the magic. Now, we, we don't believe that Africa can wait for an education process to take 150 years to unfold. We know that it's probable that there'll be some incremental improvement, but we do believe that the LEAP approach could be a truly liberating solution, especially for the women and children of our continent who struggle to gain access to learning and marketable skills. And what last year taught us was that even incremental improvement in our public schools was not guaranteed. And in fact, the trend is downwards. So we are trying to establish, a, and we're in the process of establishing, and we're in consultation with a number of uh, people to help us to establish uh, the LEAP Sub-Saharan African Education Institute, which will be for education and life sustainability, which will build around the consciousness shift logic the build around the caring and the outreach component, use the innovation that we've talked about and open new career pathways for children, which will be 21st century learning appropriate. Our great icon, Nelson Mandela, said it's in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. We don't take that on as teachers and leaders, we take that on as students. It is in our hands as students to create a better world from today for all who live in it. And we're exploring how to apply this more broadly in, than in South Africa, but also in other parts of Africa and beyond. But we were very fortunate, as Anitra said, to be referred by her to Professor Barry Hughes, fellow Club of Rome member, uh, and to ask him to look at our data and to incorporate that in the internal futures, using the international future, futures projections that he is, he's been refining over years. And if you look at this uh, base level, uh, base, base table for base case for 2015, you'll see that there's a vertical axis, axis of age categories. And the horizontal axis to the left 
is, is males, the horizontal axis to the right is females around the center point. The color coding, the red is no education, the green is primary education only, the yellow is completed through secondary education, and then the, the blue completed through tertiary education. You can see the story it tells. We have a crisis in our education. Now, what uh, the projection that, uh, that he then, Barry Hughes then developed was to show what would happen by 2030 and what would happen by 2050. And while this is encouraging, and you can see that there is some significant improvement projected without any kind of leap intervention or any similar intervention, it's still disastrous. It's still only providing opportunity at a very limited scale, uh, particularly for, well, particularly for, for women. So what is the prediction, according to Barry, for South Africa with LEAP intervention? So he's given us a number of indicators and I've got four of them to show you. The first is that if, if the methodology were to be applied more universally, then the increased enrollment and quality uh, would actually increase pr productivity. And this would also be reflected in the secondary co education completion rate if you look at the, the graph on the top right, the percentage of children, uh, of aged children, sorry, percentage of children on the vertical against timeline on the horizontal. And you can see that even as early as 2025, he was predicting a significant gap uh, between those two graphs. Equally, for years of formal tertiary education attainment by 20 to 29 year olds, again, the graph is widening significantly. Look, flipping it to economic indicators, you can see that the percentage of South African population living on less than $1.9 per day is going to be significantly reduced with the LEAP intervention. And the GDP per capita would increase significantly. So these are just some of the indicators that he, he so beautifully isolated for us and encouraged us to, to take on. So we believe this is a transformative solution and we can actually, through the LEAP Institute, share this work. We're very keen to work collaboratively with funding agencies to implement the work of the LEAP Institute, also open to possibilities for partnership and explore any kind of partnership, but also funding partnerships with public and private Canadian potential partners. Nelson Mandela's cry was a winner is a dreamer who never gives up and that's the growth mindset of LEAP. So as we prepare to reach out into Sub-Saharan Africa, we're developing a reimagined educational system where African young people have the intent and ability to create a new future. And the multiplier effect of young change makers can improve African nations' well-being. That's the only way we're going to achieve a sustainable environment, environmental reality by, by amplifying Mandela's vision. And of course, education is the key, but it's not the education of compliance. It must be the education of self-liberation, which allows children to speak truth to power. We concur entirely with the, uh, our value system concurs entirely with what I can see reflected in some of the work of, the, of, of KCOR, which is that we are saying, live differently to our children. And we are making sure that self-liberation emphasizes that it's your choice. And we're working hard to develop regenerative mindsets for a sustainable future by teaching consciously and by making sure that the uncertain road that is ahead has the hope of people making good choices to live differently. I really appreciate this opportunity. There are two links there. If anyone would like to uh, make direct contact, please do. But thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Anitra for walking so closely with me over the past uh, 16 months and for encouraging, supporting and helping me to, to develop this narrative so, so clearly. Much appreciated, back to you. So we are going to take questions now. And Carlos, are you still here? Because Carlos has to leave for another meeting. Would you like to... Um, 
if you would unmute, you can ask the first question and then if you have to leave for your meeting. I, Carlos? I, am, I am muted by the host, so. By the host. Can, All uh, right. Can Art, can we unmute Carlos? Thank you. We, no, can, we can hear you. We can hear, Carlos. we can hear you perfectly. Okay, good. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, John, for your wonderful presentation. I mean, maybe a disclaimer is, is to say that I am a fan of yours and what you are doing and, uh, and, and the leap. I will only say one particular reason why. Because the, the way you do things is even much larger than the concrete purpose of making kids succeed in the present with the present educational standards. Um, so you have succeeded in making kids from the from the, these townships be able to succeed and pass and go to university and learn science and math, which is already quite extraordinary. Congratulations for that. But in my view, um, the most important thing is that by, by using uh, in, in practical ways, really innovative pedagogic methods, you are giving them the capacity to learn by themselves about futures which are basically unknown. So uh, I, know, I know that institutions and global institutions, multilateral institutions, World Bank, etc., still rely on these uh, perspectives of the fourth, for instance, the fourth industrial revolution. I think this will not, will not happen, to be honest. It's because the cracks, the, the, the so many cracks of our systems, of our global systems makes that the future is much more uncertain than that. Which means that we will have to learn and, and, and especially younger generations will have to learn by themselves a lot to get out of the mess in which we are. And, and what I value particularly in what you do is that you are giving them the tools to do that within the current educational parameters, but also out of them, out of those parameters for, the, for uh, exploring the unknown. And so thank you for doing that. And well, maybe not everybody knows that we are working together now with, uh, within the Club of Rome International in a program we call the fifth element, uh, life for learning, learning for life, which is very much about what I just said, giving to people of all ages, by the way, the capacity to learn by themselves and, and build uh, pathways to desirable futures. And this work is very much inspired by what you have achieved and how you have achieved it. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Carlos. Can I just uh, say one thing about something you highlighted? It's when you're doing the paradigm shift, which we're trying to do, we, we don't want to use the traditional measures. We want to count what counts, not what can be counted. But historically, the system counts what counts, what can be yeah. counted as opposed to counting what counts. For us, the internalized values, the becoming loving fathers and mothers, breaking the cycles of violence, breaking the cycles of patriarchy, you know, breaking the cycles of silence equals violence, all of those elements and then, of course, just this notion of taking, taking, taking at the expense of others, which, which, have, which are foreign to, to African history, actually, but in, in, in many ways, not entirely, but relatively so. We have to reclaim that and, and find new ways of measuring what matters, which is another yeah. way of sort of counting what counts. We've got to measure what matters rather than measure what, what uh, is meaningless sometimes. Absolutely. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for coming, Carlos. Carlos is in the inner circle of the board of the International Club of Rome, in case you all are not familiar with Carlos, and doing a wonderful job in civilization and three or four others of the... Thank you, Carlos. I know you have to run off to Norb yeah. Bateson's. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to you and to all of you, and, and hello and goodbye, and we will have more occasions to...
to talk. Hopefully. The next question Bye -bye. is from Jean Doherty, followed by one from Marilyn Mosley Gordonier. Jean? Thank you. Um, John, that was an absolutely fabulous presentation and, and very intriguing. I can see possibilities in a lot of different ways. But the question I, I, I have is, you mentioned that you've got six schools in, in four territories with a thousand students. How do you decide which students you pick? Who comes into the school? What are the, do you have a selection criterion? Yeah, we're in late stage entry, so we don't we don't run K to, K to twelve. We run grade eight to twelve. Mm -hmm. So we do allow the students, in a sense, to self-select. We put them. We encourage them to come to extra lessons when they're in grade seven. They they're asked to apply. They apply, they they show their interest. They show their endeavour, and on that basis, we basically accept them. When we take, we have some testing, uh, which which uh, people then. Uh, who understand charter schools are very critical of. But our testing is, is not to uh, test for a particular entry standard. It's to eliminate problems that we can't deal with. So just to give you an example, the mathematics test at, at grade seven level, the average uh, uh, gap between the students coming into our school and where they should be is for maths between four and six years. So when they come in as 13 year olds, they actually on average have the so-called ability of a nine year old. And so, so, you know, we start with that as a given. We don't start with that as an exclusion. We never take a child who's already been into a um, advantaged or privileged context. So if somebody's managed to find a way into a, a unique uh, opportunity in a school where they're on the scholarship and they want to come back to the township we say, that's your opportunity, you follow that. Our job is to open opportunity for children who are faced with no choices. Um, so there is some testing. There is the uh, work ethic demonstration that, that the students have to apply and we take them on a camp and, and they show their interest and their ability to, their desire really. And on that basis, we have to make selections. And of course we're oversubscribed by hundreds. Um, but bearing in mind that we, we're trying to do this as laboratories of teaching and learning so that we can share that as quickly as we can with the system. And that's our real goal, is to work ourselves out of the job and to make sure that all schools are working in a way that create real hope and real possibilities for children. Mm -hmm. John, I'm not sure that you said that it's from the lowest quintile uh -huh of the yeah. economic scale that you oh, yes. take them only. Sorry, that's, that's a very important criterion. If they, if, you know, if they could afford, in, in our country, if you can afford a better quality of education, you buy it. Mm -hmm. So we will only take children who have no chance of affording that, that, that option. We have some public schools that are semi-private schools or semi-independent, and they become the target for families who are upwardly mobile. We take children by and large, who only have a single parent, 80% of our children have no active fathers in their lives, 80%. No. These are, this is an emasculated society. The fathers are in retreat and they're, they're on the run and they're often drunk just to, just to spell it out. This is our problem. We've got that kind of world. And ironically, the boys are left uh, uh, deserted in these times because as they start to irritate the mothers, the mothers push them out whereas they hold their daughters a little bit closer to them. So it's an ironic twist. And the gender-based violence uh, problems are huge as a consequence mm -hmm. because we've got so many unemployed and uh, unemployable young men sort of patrolling without any uh, belonging other than in the group that they're in, which is always dangerous. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Marilyn? Marilyn. John, hi, it's good to see you. Um, I had the um, pleasure, I should say, Yusikor has had the honor of working with John and Momfella and Anitra on the um, 
wonderful Reef schools. And um, I'm just so excited to see you again and hear of the continued progress. And my question for you is using distance learning via cell phones um, and thinking about how to expand this around um, the African continent, how do you translate the trend, how do you translate the transformative elements of LEAP, supporting the emotional well-being, self-liberation, the development of the whole child that has been so incredibly essential to making this a success? It gives me yeah. chills to think of it. Yeah. You know, there's obviously a, a layered answer is probably better than the one I'm going to give you, but let me just give you a sort of crystallized element of the answer. And that is, when we try to control children's emotional development through communication, we actually continue the oppression. So obviously face to face that's possible as we make it impossible for children to be honest or open. So our principle in our work is to create emotional safety for children to not be judged by what they say, but to feel free to say it. Now that's, you know, that's the principle of healing for addicts. That's the principle of healing for children who are in, involved in self-mutilation or eating disorders. So it's the same thing. You create a space in which they can deal with their inner feelings without, without feeling that as they declare that, they're in trouble or that they judged. So our transition was, how do we do that using cell phone technology? And we realized we encouraged the children to form groups and to talk to each other, not always supervised. Now you could say children being children you know, sometimes they will hijack that and do what they want to do. But because our children understand this is a support group and there's a process that they've lived face to face, it's interesting how they report back that they took control of those, group, those groups and supported each other and said, well, how are you doing? What are you doing? What's your struggle? Is your father still angry? Is he still drunk? Is he, you know, they went to the place that we couldn't possibly go to. Now, that's a huge dimensional shift when you allow children and you trust them, and then you ask them to reflect later on, how did that go? Obviously, at the same time, all of our teachers are facilitating, if they're doing a maths group, the first question is, check in. How are you feeling? What have you brought into this room? Mindfulness, let's calm ourselves, let's do some breathing. So you're consciously raising the consciousness to be able to say, how am I doing? Why am I struggling today? What are the elements that I have control over? So that's where the choice element comes in. Then, of course, the easy part is to get all these bits and pieces that people have downloaded as content. Mm -hmm. And you overload children with content and forget that learning is processed. So we are trying to work the right balance on that. We haven't got it right. But we do know that we did enough last year for our children to say, we can still do this. We can still do this, which is, which is a good story. Brilliant, it's absolutely brilliant. And I, I just wanted to um, ask how you're doing in terms of um, gathering the, the cell phones you need um, and if, if there's anything that we can do to help you. Yeah, well, we've got another, you know, we've got another uh, 300 children that have just come in into grade eight. And so we've, we've, we've now got, you know, need another hundred phones for that group because some of them don't have phones. So we're back to, we're back to the, to the survival mode of, of that. But thank you for asking. We, we do need help. And if there is a way we can, can continue that, it'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Marilyn has been, is on the USACOR board and has been very active with the educational uh, emphasis we've been doing for the past year with some of the members from South America, as well as John and Mampella and members in North America. Thank you, Marilyn. Ted, Thanks, you had some comments? Yeah, this, uh, this is very familiar to those of us who worked in almost every country, even rich ones, where they have peripheralized places or, or, or uh, disadvantaged groups. And uh, I'm just wondering if you are having much direct contact with, say, the Australians, the Canadians, uh, some of the Latin Americans who are trying to get learning into, uh, 
into the more disadvantaged places. And the second question, which is to what extent are the community and families directly involved? Because of course the Ubuntu notion is that you, you are part of your community and you can't educate one without the other. I'm going to start with the second part of the question, just to mm -hmm. answer that one. Yeah. It's a more direct <laughs> question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> obviously, if you're going to live with the Ubuntu values, mm -hmm. it's got to be family as, you know, as first. But as I said to you, family dynamics and uh, family disintegration is part of our reality. And so our children are often very angry about family. And so we have to work with that process and bring the family in. So at any intervention ever that we can, we bring family in, mm -hmm. into individual conversations, into group conversations, family comes in, we organize transport for our families, we organize events after hours because a lot of them work long, long hours and can't get off work. We do Saturday morning uh, meetings with families and our families can walk into the school at any time and, and ask to speak with somebody to help. So that's, that's, a, that's a very important principle. Mm -hmm. What we battle with is when the family hands over their kind of responsibility to us. You know, there's a, there's a victimhood sometimes that plays in where, okay, thank goodness you exist, now get on with it. And you must sort it out and you can do what you like with our children. If you have to beat them, beat them, do anything you like. You know, it's a really strange, but quite understandable in some ways. So that's a tough navigation all the time. What we insist on is that every one of our children is involved in a social development project in their own community from the minute they join the school. So that means they are attached to a, a creche, an old age home, a center for you know, a library, or some center for communi community living with pensioners or whatever. And their responsibility over the five years is to get involved in social development, not to start something, but to work with what's already started. So there's again, the strengthening and the teaching agency through experiential learning. Now, if we go- COVID has put a, put a, thrown a monkey wrench into that. Yes. Say that again, sorry. I say, I suspect COVID has made that much more difficult. Well, well, well strange thing happened that uh, the distribution of food parcels and soup and, and food to impoverished people has been so badly um, abused by, by people who see opportunity in terms of making money out of free gifts and so on, yeah. that all six of our schools became centers for distribution. Mm -hmm. And so the children would, would be the regulators. And so we were always able to guarantee that if we got 200 parcels, food parcels, mm -hmm. they would go directly one at a time to a family. And our children became the agents in that. In fact, right now we are, we're providing soup to a thousand children in one of our schools. One of our schools is providing soup through a brewery that is, is making soup in their, in their brewery their containers and distributing vast now. So it's actually been remarkable how our children have looked for solutions. We had a lot of um, need for, uh, for feminine products to be distributed amongst the girls and our children raised it. And our teachers actually put, put money into that fund. And again, the children were the ones to come and distribute and make sure that everyone had access to what they needed. So it's been a strange thing. But to go back to your first question of how do we relate then to, to others? I mean, we want to share, we want to share this, this story. That's why we want to get the LEAP Institute. It's not just a story, it's a methodology and lots of learning with it. Uh, we've worked quite a lot in, in America with partners, particularly Silicon Valley partners to try and help us to shape our thinking around what is useful in terms of uh, technology and digital and so on. So we've actually done some work strangely enough in Oakland with a project there of young boys who are being put through a project called the Hidden Genius Program. And what we have in common with the Hidden Genius is the affirmation of expectations. And we've really enjoyed that. And they've brought a group out to South Africa and we've had groups into their project as we've explored the transfer, if you like, of this methodology. Because the one thing that doesn't happen in that particular project is the self-liberation. 
everything is incentivized. So the children are paid money to, to make progress. Now that, that can be argued for, but it has some counterproductive consequences because it's not the intrinsic motivation, it's the extrinsic motivation. So we've, we've helped to push that a little bit into better balance. We've, we've, we've uh, obviously worked in a few other countries like Zambia and Kenya just tentatively and, uh, and the De Democratic Republic of Congo, but not programmatically enough to be able to draw conclusions. All we know is there's a great hunger for this, for this kind of work. So we really need to set ourselves up and that's where Anitra is really helping with Mampela to position us to be able to set up a better platform for that kind of sharing. Sorry, that was a very long answer. Oh, thank you, that was very good. <laughs> Cameron, you had some questions? Uh, yes, you, uh, you answered part one of my question, thanks to uh, Mr. Manning. Uh, wonderful presentation again, Mr. Gilmore. Uh, the second part of my, uh, I guess, original question would be, um, with the advancement of China into the continent, um, or the development of the African Union, these <clears throat> potential threats to your developments? How much time do we have? Um, <laughs> 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 uh, you're asking one of the big questions that, uh, you know, that, that causes a lot of uh, back and forth. So let me just answer it from a practitioner's point, you know, from somebody who's trying to shift behavior and shift attitudes and be part of that shift myself. We will only be able to withstand the next level of colonial interference if we liberate ourselves. We cannot wait for another enslavement to happen before we wake up and say we must free ourselves again. So there are different kinds of neo-colonial realities. One is the commercial, materialistic, neo-colonial, let's call it the bold and the beautiful stroke McDonald's neo-colonialism, which just invades and eliminates uh, unique uniqueness of landscape and replaces it with the uniformity, which has to be fought. Uh, uh, McDonald's and um, Kentucky Fried Chicken are are the most successful franchises in South Africa. So we have, and then if you watch TV, we, we playing reruns of The Bold and the Beautiful and The Young and the Restless and all these kinds of things. So there's that element of what I'd call emotional neo-colonial work. And then it flips over to gangster rap and to a whole lot of things that actually reinforce subculture and don't reinforce culture. So there's that. Then there's this ominous reality that our politicians are selling out to the highest bidder and that the highest bidder is China. So, so I see that as a huge risk and we've got to educate our children to see the problem with that and to be able to speak truth to power. So I see the, the need for this kind of education which will sensitize, allow children to get real perspective not to be seduced so easily by what used to be the trinkets from the missionaries, you know, to keep, keep the people happy, maybe a, a drink or two, a bit of rum or whatever, uh, to now, you know, we'll give you a little bit of money for this and a little bit of money for that and we'll develop that, but you give us your minds or you give us your big institutions. So we're under serious siege and I'm disappointed uh, that that the soul of Africa is, is up for grabs again. Thank you for that answer. Um, next is Sucha Man. Are, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can hear. Uh, would, you, would you want me to unmute the video? Yes, I think you're unmuted. I mean, I'm hearing you. Oh, okay. Let's talk about the video. There we go. Okay, thank you very much, John. You really um, uh, are helping me to understand what I need to do. I'm working with a couple of schools, and uh, wonderful. And uh, now, one thing coming into um, 
question is you mentioned the population of south of, uh, of africa is going to grow to 2 billion from 1 billion within next 30 years and and we know that population pressure wildlife environment sustainability they, they sort of go together impact each other so i'm, I'm just wondering how are you addressing that issue Or if you are able to address yeah. Look, in a, in a free society, the only way to address that issue, in my view, is through education. There isn't another way. Educate the girl child as a priority. Because the World Bank shows us their statistics of an educated girl. You know, you Im impact, impact one educated girl and you impact 16 people at least. You know, there's, there, there's that kind of that kind of ratio. It doesn't always work the same way with the boys for reasons that are complex, but understandable. So the, the, the reason that consciousness education is critical is to bring girls to the place where they realize they have choices. We have so many young girls who go, I didn't realize I had a choice. They've grown up in survival mode and they've grown up imagining there's an automatic trajectory. They've watched their families, they've watched their mothers, they're cautioned, but they, they know there's an inevitability that they will have children before the age of 18. One in three children in South Africa has a baby before the age of 18. There's the problem. And then what does that involve? The boy carries on doing whatever he was doing and the girl drops out. The school is uh, in, intolerant and the, the, the young woman becomes part of the unemployable mess. Now, clearly you can't just keep opening schools that do this work. We have to take this learning and integrate it into public education. So what I would love, for example, to be able to do is to understand you, the work you're doing in Punjab and say, okay, what are you doing and how are you, how are you positioning this you know, how are you positioning the liberation of these children? Uh, and, and that's for me the solution. I can't stop the children from doing what they do. They have to stop themselves. So, okay. I mean, it's so. Yeah. I, I, so, in your prediction, if, um, if girls in Africa are getting educated, will that have an impact on your uh, prediction from 1 billion to 2 billion? Oh, it would have a very significant impact. In fact, we needed, we should put uh, Barry Hughes uh, pro projections in, 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 into that. But as I told you, if we're already seeing the impact of the average of five siblings has become two siblings, there's a significant uh, impact on that. Now that may not carry through, you know, when you don't do the full work and you do partial work or partially integrated work. But if we can bring the five down to three, then we're at least hitting the right the right the right numbers okay great thank you very much john no thank Excellent. you thank you for the area of interest yeah. i'm wa wondering whether other people from the floor might have uh, comments valerie hume is still with us um and she has been the uh, one of the driving forces with Madeleine Aubrey in KCOR about women's uh, rights. So Valerie, if you're listening, if you could unmute yourself, um, perhaps she's not there. I've asked her to- I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Good. I'm wondering what your comments are on his, he has 66% female uh, students, and they've done extremely well. And, and I think that we would find that where there were other uh, opportunities for women in African and in other countries, that the women can do very well indeed, that they aren't always given the opportunities. I'm so glad to hear that these young women are giving, being given the opportunity. Three, three of our, our six schools are led by a young woman who are the principals and their ages range from 28 to 31. And they were graduates from the school. 
So there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that when young women experience self-liberating learning themselves, they become ambassadors, passionate ambassadors for the work. And really that's what we need. We need a cascade here. It's not gonna happen in a linear, you know, one plus one, we need the multiplier effect. So I agree with you. And the young women take to these opportunities with voracity and purpose, which of course then helps them to make better decisions about their own bodies. And, and when and there yet, are enough people like that, enough young women, and enough young women making such success of, of their, their opportunities, it simply encourages more to do so. Well, there's nothing more powerful in a broken community than a positive role model. You know, when, when, the, when the, the role model, they look at people and say, how does she do that? How is she managing that? And she's open to have the answer, to share the answer. Isn't that beautiful? That's when, that's when real peer education is happening. It's not the education of power. It's the education of, of uh, humanity, just sharing. You know? It's very impressive to hear what you say. Well, thank you. And I understand your passion for that too. To take, I'm the father of, of twin daughters. And I've, you know, as they've grown up, they're 22 now and just finishing their university degree. So I've lived with them the, the reality of being a young woman in, this, in a society like ours. And it's not a simple matter, you know, and to rise above that requires activating resilience at the deepest possible level. But once it's activated, oh, the power. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. Thank Jeff you. Passmore is the next commenter. Thanks, uh, and John. Uh, very uh, stimulating, very interesting presentation. Um, I'm wondering about something that may be too much of a luxury, but my question was whether or not as your students uh, become more educated, they start to worry about things like COVID and vaccines and uh, other topics such as climate change, or uh, is that simply just, uh, uh, you know, beyond the, uh, the scope of their concerns, uh, given the pyramid diagram that you showed earlier in your slides? Well, I mean, the whole goal of our organization is to liberate from the lowest level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If, if, if children get trapped there, they get trapped in the entitlement of poverty. And the entitlement of poverty is almost unbreakable in when it becomes a practice of learned helplessness. So when you, when you activate children at a very young age of 13, as they are forming their values of, in, through the period window of adolescence, the, the issue is not to rush the issues, it's to, it's to give the insight so that the children can step back when an issue is presented. I can tell you that young African children living in squalor understand the sustainable development goals more, more naturally than children living in privilege. They just understand them differently. When you understand hunger, you understand the problem with sustainability. So what we do is we work with the children to, give, to ask them to step back to see what's happening and to describe how they feel about the inequity. If you start with the unequalness, then surely it's not that far to go to the matters of uh, climate change and, and sustainability. So we get our children planting. We get them planting in, in regenerative projects. We get them harvesting. We get them hands in the soil. We teach them the beauty of that and the joy of, uh, of being in that process. That's for life. I uh, thank you for that. And I, I think a really nice takeaway from what you just said is don't rush the issues, uh, rush the insight. <laughs> but uh, um, so on the COVID thing, there was a there was a TED talk. Sorry, I just have a quick supplemental. Um, there was a TED talk recently by a woman who had spent a lot of time working in Nigeria and, uh, the, you know, the whole issue of vaccinations. Uh, and in this case, she was talking about uh, polio, but that the problem wasn't with women. Uh, or with girls, but with um, 
she didn't use the term, but I'll use it, uh, you know, uh, traditional medicine men who have all these superstitions uh, that, uh, you know, uh, getting a vaccine is going to give you, uh, uh, you know, uh, AIDS or, or whatever other myths that they're, uh, that they're perpetrating. Yeah. And her main takeaway was, and one that I've lived with for many years, is that it all comes down to trust. And, uh, you know, you, you really need to build trust in order to uh, move anything forward. I mean, if people don't trust you, then science doesn't matter. And if people do trust you, science doesn't matter. And that doesn't mean that science doesn't matter. It means it all comes down to trust. Sure. So if you look at the, uh, the way that's playing out in Southern Africa, certainly, is there are, there are conspiracy theorists, there are faith people, faith-based groups who resist the you know, idea of vaccinations because of historical uh, abuse of vaccinations you know, way back to actually cause damage and the association with biological interference and so on. But in reality, every child uh, understands the dilemma and they position themselves very vocally one way or the other. I'm not going to have the vaccine or I'm going to have the vaccine. There, there definitely is that divide. But the beautiful thing of our young leaders is because they have the clarity, they set a role modeling that doesn't become ideological. They don't take an ideological position or an anti-faith position or an anti-traditional medicine position. They simply say, Let's look at what we need, what matters, and bring it down. So, you know, if I, if I lecture a hundred young African people, they will probably leave the room with the same thoughts they had in, even if I've given them lots of information. When a young woman aged 24 speaks to a group of 20 other young women, it's probable that the 24, if the young woman is inspiring, will change their thinking. So really there's... <laughs> There's no greater power than the power of young role models. It just isn't a greater power. And we've got to develop them and free them and say, get out there and do it. The activism of youth. That's how our country achieved liberation. Through the Thank you. Consciousness. Yeah. Ted, did you want to comment on this population question? I, I just wanted to say that John has led perfectly into one that's coming up in a, in a few weeks on population issues globally. And he has, I think, made the point very clearly that education of women is probably the single most critical factor. In fact, there's some interesting books out there looking at trends by country. And by and large, women's education can be found to be something like a, it's, it's first amongst 10 factors. And it covers about 50% of the causation of causing uh, or correlating most strongly with population uh, growth reductions. So I just made my one point is that uh, what you have said is probably going to be covered in spades in, a, in another month. And please come and talk to us at the time or come, come and be on that panel if it's of interest to you. It certainly would be of interest. And I want to just, I want to just counter, counter my own voice in that. I think that education of women in isolation, just women, mm -hmm. is dangerous yeah. because you're looking for societal shift. Mm -hmm. So the best kind of education is education that amplifies the right to every voice yeah. and makes sure that the patriarchy is, is uh, suppressed, if you like, or at least eliminated. But, but certainly we need to have a different picture of leadership. We have, need to have a different picture of, of uh, teachers and young women leading is going to, going to accelerate that. But, so I'd love to be part of that. Yes, thank you for Please that. Please come. I think that, some questions uh, as well. <laughs> that, that John hasn't also emphasized enough the role that these people play in their own community, in their own townships, which are all in the lowest economic quintile of the country because the girls growing up see that there's another model and they see that some, somebody who lives quite close to them has made it in that other model and that gives them hope. And it also is very, very pleasing to the older women. I 
have only met the younger women who are students. I haven't met the older women who are their mothers, cousins, aunts, uh, and so forth, grandmothers. But they, they're wildly pleased in the photographs that this young woman from their economic background and community has made it. So everybody knows about her and she becomes a very important model for the entire community, wherein they had none before, no models. If I may, uh, I just wanna follow up, John, on what you just said about the education of women in isolation is dangerous. I, because when, when Ted was speaking, I began to worry about what has become, to some extent anyway, conventional wisdom. I had a friend who spent his career working at UNICEF and it was all about educating women, educating women, which, um, you know, obviously, especially when it comes to things like birth control is key, but um, it, your, your uh, response leads me to ask you then, um, how do you deal with those groups of roving boys that have no purpose? And, and when you, as a practical matter, when you're thinking about who are you going to uh, uh, have enroll in your schools and you're sort of interviewing them or whatever the process is, how do you ensure that you're not just focusing on girls? Well, again, just one step back. If 75% if of the households in which our children live, children have experienced gender-based violence in some form or another, they've witnessed. So it's a high percentage, 75%. So only one in four families, if you like, somehow escapes this uh, curse. The perpetrators of gender-based violence are 98, 9% male. Mm -hmm. So we have to do two things. We have to prepare a young woman to be able to deal with that horror, that reality and navigate it while it exists. And at the, in parallel, we have to start to develop a brigade of young men who have insight on their own patriarchal tendencies and their own history of entitlement and their own abusive patterns that they, they've, they've had for generations shown to them, compounded by families being separated by migrant labor. So it's, it's, it's multiple complexities. It's no, no blame in this. It's just, that's what it is. Yeah. So I don't think we can afford to take a single view on this. You know, teach, teach women to do karate. Right, let's teach women to do karate. That's great. You know, lots of organizations are saying that's the solution. That's not the solution. We're defending what shouldn't be happening. We're teaching people to defend what shouldn't be happening. But of course, teach them to do karate if that will help in a particular given context. But can we not get boys and girls? Because the girls carry the anger of their mothers about men. Now, if you've had three generations of failed uh, familial frameworks, and the pattern is that the men abuse and leave, what does the child internalize? The child is, and the child is a boy. Our boys cry about this. And they say, everyone thinks I'm like my father. And I am like my father. What do I do about that, you know? There's, there's where our real work has got to happen. And it can only really happen if girls are present not always in the conversation. I have no qualms separating the boys and girls for discussions, but it's very important that they come back to share with each other what they've decided so that the conversation then becomes accountable and not just this idealized conversation of how do we defend against these monsters or how do we avoid getting blamed for what other people do. You know, it's the very, they're very victim-like conversations emerge from that but it isn't easy I, you know it's it's a this is a tough territory for for um africa not, not easy art, what, what, what... art hunter wait a minute are, are we almost finished with this because time is growing short and art hunter still has question it was, i was just going to ask for a quick number like in your six schools how many students are girls and how many are boys so 66 percent are girls okay yeah okay art the... Yeah, one of the things that really impressed me, John, was um, your, your very impressive performance in terms of number who graduate even under very trying conditions. And uh, I would think that, that possibly the mainstream educational system 
might want to be picking up some of the techniques that you're using um, <clears throat> and uh, which also suggests to me there might even be some resistance within society that means that you are, are um, <clears throat> taking on the status quo and, and uh, causing social disruption. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about both sides of that coin. Yeah. And, and, and perhaps in the process as well, you could address financing because you've touched on it a little bit and I sit back and I say, well, you know, you've, you've got corporate, you've got alumni, you've got the state itself. You, yeah, you know, there's a number of, of cash flows that I'm sure you've tapped into. Anyway. Yeah. Wait, John, before you answer, perhaps since it's only a couple minutes before the end, we should stop the recording now. So whatever John says about the South African Department of Education is not on the recording. Is that fine with Art and John? John, yes. it's, it's your call, John. It's fine. I don't mind either way. Um, you well, know, I, we're I, almost at the point to stop the recording okay. anyhow. So why doesn't Art stop the recording and then we'll be free That's to fine. discuss. That's fine. But, well, would you like to, to thank our speaker? Anitra, could you thank our speaker? Absolutely. <laughs> so, John, we're extremely happy to have uh, had all this information. And I can see that everybody, although they aren't all in education, are very, very interested in, in the process and also the COVID process of how you adapted to, to the uh, closure of the schools without any distance learning IT tools and then found the cell phones. And we're extremely grateful for you to stay up so late at night and it's only the middle of the afternoon, our time. And thank everybody for, for coming and uh, educating yourself about what's happening in Mom Fella's section of the world. So we thank, thank you very much, John. And we'll stop the formal recording, but we will continue discussion.